So good evening, everyone. My name's Helen. I work for Devon Wildlife Trust on the Green Minds Project in Plymouth. Um, Devon Wildlife Trust are a partner on this exciting uh, Plymouth City Council-led project, which is funded by the European Regional Development Fund's Urban Innovative Actions until August next year. Um, that I mean this year, actually, so this summer. Uh, it's a unique opportunity to bring our experience and enthusiasm for wildlife and nature to the green and blue spaces of a large city like Plymouth. And so we're doing things like training community groups with skills to monitor their local patch, um, working to look, see meadow improvements across the city, helping to set up a tree nursery at Dereford Community Park, uh, and taking action for insects uh, by looking at uh, alternatives to using pesticides. And we're helping to make space for nature while helping local people reconnect with the natural world and getting all the physical mental health benefits we know this can bring. So it's a win-win situation really. Uh, and you can take action for wildlife by visiting the greenmindsplymouth.com website uh, and you'll find out more about the project and then any events coming up in the spring and summer as the project draws to a close. And on to the main event this evening. Uh, we're going to learn all about trees and our speaker tonight is Jack Rivers and I'll let Jack introduce himself uh, and um, looking forward to the talk. Thanks Jack and over to you. Cheers. Well hi everyone it's really great to have you all here today uh, for what will be my final Green Minds talk. Um, so I'm Jack, I work for the Devon Biodiversity Records Centre uh, so I get involved in all sorts of biological recording uh, and community ecology work um, and I'm lucky enough to get to do these talks for Green Minds. Um, so trees are one of my all-time favourite subjects so I've tried to cram in as much as possible for tonight's talk. I'll be predominantly focusing on broadleaf tree species which are native to the UK and we'll cover all things such as their ecology, how to ID some common species and some of the impacts that they have on environments. Uh, as Helen said, there will be time for questions at the end, so do please put them in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, but without further ado, let's get on with tonight's talk. So, trees first emerged around 390 million years ago, which is around 10 million years after the first vascular plants emerged. So, these first trees were more closely related to ferns, giant club mosses and horsetails. Now we can still find a whole host of ferns today, but both giant horsetails and club mosses have since disappeared. Um, but there are smaller relatives that are still present today and you can find them throughout the UK. Um, so if you do ever come across them, then they are incredibly old plants. Um, so do look them up and um, cause you're quite likely to see them. So, Conifers, which are trees that hold their leaves, such as pines, uh, they first emerged around 250 million years ago, with species such as monkey puzzle trees being present around them. Um, and then pine trees followed a few million years after that. Now, hardwoods such as magnolias would not emerge until another 100 million years later. And by 95 million years ago, broadleaf trees, uh, which are trees that tend to hold their leaves, um, they began to emerge around them, and we would recognise uh, similar species to oaks, willows and maples, which were all present around them. So then by the time us humans came along, uh, which was around 315,000 years ago, trees had long well been established throughout the planet, and they shaped massive uh, woodland ecosystems, and these ecosystems uh, were vital for human development. And so since then, trees have played a really important role in shaping our lives uh, from their roles in folklore and religions to the food they provide for us. And also uh, the important wood that provides building materials for shelters and ships and all sorts of things. So what's the state of uh, woodlands in the UK? Well, it's probably best to start a little bit further back. Now, historically, the UK would have been far more wooded with broadleaf forests covering swathes of the UK landscape. Now, the main disruption to this would have been large herbivores, which would have created a mosaic of more open habitats through grazing and trampling. By the Neolithic periods, humans began to convert some of this wooded land to agricultural land. 
and approximately half of the UK is estimated to have been cleared of woodland during the Bronze Age, which is around 2000 BC. Now, over the coming ages, woods would continue to be cleared and managed by successive generations. And between 1086 to 1349 AD, uh, the, dooms, uh, the Doomsday Book would actually reference woodland cover as being around 15% of the UK. So that's already a massive decline. Now, by the 20th century, woodland cover was approximately 5%, and the requirements for timber post-World War I were only growing. And this led to wide-scale planting of conifer trees throughout the UK. And we still see a lot of this across the landscape today. By 1950, uh, concerns for our natural woodland became more prevalent, and especially as intensive agriculture developed further. And this led to more clearance of woodland. And as a result of that, efforts to actually conserve our native woodlands intensified even more. So currently, we're sitting at around 13.2% woodland coverage for the UK, with over half of this being conifer plantations. Now, the area of ancient broadleaf woodland covers a tiny 2.5% of the UK. And of our native woodlands, only 7% is actually considered to be in a good ecological condition, um, which is really tiny. Um, however, the good news is the cover of woodland is slowly growing throughout the UK, uh, and there is a growing demand for healthier and wilder woodlands. And this is due to the role that they play in combating uh, climate change, uh, the ways that they support biodiversity, and actually a lot of the benefits they have for human well-being. Uh, but I will go on to this a bit later. So now we'll start to discuss some of the ecology behind trees. Um, now, the life cycle of trees is really amazing, uh, and they have really diverse ways in which they survive, um, but there's no better place to start than at the seed. Now, seeds are an incredibly clever package of nutrients and genetic makeup, similar to our DNA, uh, which ensure that a tree can survive and develop within the right environment and climate. Now, seeds allow trees to bide their time until the perfect conditions arise for them to be able to grow. So the way in which they can be distributed varies. Uh, now, often seeds are carried by the wind, by water, or they're often dispersed by animals. An acorn, for example, may be dispersed simply through uh, a falling from the tree and rolling close by, uh, where it then might develop underneath the canopy of the parent tree. However, it's more commonly dispersed by animals. And one of those important animals is the jay. Uh, and they're incredibly important in this process as they'll bury uh, caches of acorns that they hope to later find and feed upon. Um, or even in some cases in the spring, when the seedling first develops, uh, they produce these almost embryonic leaves called cotyledons. And these are incredibly rich in nutrients. And so they provide a really nutritious food source for them. However, as the nature of burying seeds in random places, they're likely to be forgotten about. And often these seeds will become grown over by brambles and other scrub. And this is actually really important for those slow growing trees as it allows them to safely develop under cover. And actually, it's one of those important reasons to allow scrub to develop in wild landscapes as opposed to clearing it whenever you see it. Now, there are other methods that trees will disperse seeds. So birch, for example, produces lots and lots of seeds, which are incredibly small, approximately between two to three millimetres. And these seeds have tiny wings on them, uh, which allow them to be dispersed up to one mile away from the parent tree. So they can cover really great distances just via the wind alone. And that means that they can quickly colonize new areas and establish themselves despite low success rates in survival. Now, a tree becomes a sapling when it reaches over three foot in height, and the rate of growth will vary depending on the species of tree and the climatic conditions it finds itself in. So trees up in moorlands and high altitudes tend to have tougher uh, living conditions, and so they tend to be more stunted in growth. Um, but at this point, uh, as a sapling, it uh, is survived the most dangerous part of its life, and that's by avoiding grazing, harsh frosts, and any earlier 
any other early competition from other plants around them that might be faster growing and might shade them out. So at this point, their stems are far more flexible than they would be as a mature tree. And this is due to the lack of air that's incorporated into their cells. And that results from a slower growth rate, so they can focus on being a bit denser. Um, however, the lack of air actually in their cells allows them to bend in the wind. Uh, it allows them to also be more resistant to fungi, and it allows them to easily compartmentalize any wounds that they might get from things brushing past them and snapping off parts. And that's ultimately as there's less structure to recover. So it's also at this point that a tree begins to develop stability. And that's through the process of the sapling actually bending back and forth, uh, usually in the wind. And what this does is it produces micro tears, um, which rebuild the stem of the plant and make it stronger. And this allows for the stem to expand and harden. And this is not particularly dissimilar to how humans might build muscle. So if you go into the gym, you're actually tearing small parts of your muscle and then it redevelops, or even bone in some cases with small fractures, they can actually come back harder. Now, often trees such as oaks will fall within that close proximity to the parent tree, and that can put them under excess shade, uh, which is not ideal if you're a sapling. So trees within these conditions will often develop more sensitive leaves to be able to utilize the small amount of light which actually makes it through the canopy. However, this can also make them more susceptible um, to harsh sunlight if there's a sudden opening in the canopy, uh, if a other tree were to fall. And actually, if you've got really hot summer conditions as well, uh, that can be particularly bad um, if they're really exposed. So with many species, it's actually thought that the parent tree will in fact support those saplings as well through an underground network of roots and fungi, which can transport and break down nutrients, which the sapling may actually struggle to derive independently. So in fact, fungi play a key role throughout a tree's life, uh, which I'll talk about more, but actually fungi play a major role in the entire ecosystem uh, due to their ability to actually break down uh, tough compounds and transport those nutrients throughout an environment. So mature trees. So a tree is typically considered mature once it starts producing fruits or flowers. For an oak, this is around 40 years into its life, with productivity of an oak peaking at around 80 to 120 years old. However, productivity in oaks can actually continue up until they're 300 years old. Now, in contrast to this, other species such as rowans may start producing berries from as young as 15 years old. Uh, but they then conclude their life at around 120 years old. So although they're quite long living compared to a lot of species in ourselves, um, that's quite small in terms of broadleaf tree species. So actually there is a large amount of variation in broadleaf trees in terms of what is considered mature. Um, so yeah, sadly, there's no strict way to define it. Ultimately, as a tree, your main goal really is to uh, occupy the maximum amount of space above ground for light uh, and below ground for water to, uh, uh, and also to be able to gather those nutrients, as that gives you the best chance to be able to reproduce. Mature trees are therefore often in competition with one another, uh, but they may have to wait for the opportunity to rapidly occupy space and grow due to um, developing in an environment where there are already uh, mature trees surrounding them. And even in some cases, the parent tree will be occupying that space and inhibiting uh, the saplings from growing. So leaves ultimately play the role of a food factory for trees, and they do this by utilising light uh, via a pigment called chlorophyll. And it's chlorophyll which gives leaves that really bright green colour However, they're also reliant on a consistent supply of nutrients and water, uh, which are derived from their vast network of roots. However, these do also work in conjunction with numerous other organisms, such as fungi uh, and their mycelium networks. Um, so for example, a mature oak, uh, the root of a mature oak can actually contain over a hundred fungi species alone. And that allows them uh, to utilize different fungi 
depending on the climatic conditions or soil conditions, as certain fungi will be better at deriving nutrients uh, from other sources. And that allows the oak to be quite adaptable in the way that it takes up nutrients. So species such as alder, which is typically found in wet areas and wet woodlands, uh, will utilize bacteria within their roots. And they use that to extract nitrogen from the environment. And nitrogen plays a really vital role in developing proteins. And these proteins in particular are useful for producing chlorophyll, which is that pigment that I mentioned. So trees are actually reliant on a vast network of tubes, which are not dissimilar to our own circulatory system. And it relies on those to transport it all throughout their structure from stem to branches to leaves. Now the movement of water throughout a tree is only partially understood. So typically we're taught, taught about transpiration, uh, capillary action and osmosis. And these are processes that somewhat rely on the molecular structure of water. So uh, water molecules tend to stick together. So as water evaporates out of the leaves of a tree, it pulls up more water molecules. So that's one way of thinking about it. Um, capillary action is where you have small tubes. So if you think about a thin glass of water, if you fill it right up to the top, you tend to see that uh, the water might actually go above the glass and that's capillary action. And osmosis is the movement usually of water through cells, so usually from a high concentration to a low concentration. And typically that's how we describe the movement of water through trees. But this only goes so far to describe it. And actually there's quite a lot we don't know. So for example, water pressure in trees is often at its highest in the spring, just before buds burst. Uh, and that's typically why uh, in Canada, they all tap maple syrup at that time. Um, and in addition to this, you can actually hear the movement of water in the trees at this time, um, not with the human here, but with uh, recording equipment. And you can supposedly hear bubbles moving through it as well. And what trees will actually do over the winter is store some of this water and that allows, uh, well, it means the tree will expand somewhat as well. And so that doesn't disprove, but it makes uh, there more to think about when it comes to capillary action and how the water is actually moving throughout the tree. So one of the defining features of broad leaves is the dropping of leaves in the winter, um, as opposed to conifers, which will remain evergreen, bar a few species such as larch. Now, this plays multiple roles as it allows the trees to withstand winter storms. So essentially by dropping leaves, it's like dropping the sail on a boat. So if you've got high winds, you don't want your leaves catching all the wind and ripping off your limbs. Um, so by dropping those leaves, it makes you more streamlined and prevents you from any injuries that might occur through storms. But actually as well, there's quite a lot of water throughout leaves. And if you're in particularly cold conditions, then the freezing of the leaves isn't going to be good for the tree. So the dropping of leaves also allows trees to be able to excrete any unwanted nutrients. Um, but also you might see the reddening or the discoloring leaves turning orange. And that's partially the result of the breakdown of chlorophyll. And they break down chlorophyll uh, to be able to use the components of it uh, to rebuild chlorophyll, uh, chlorophyll in the spring in the new leaves. But actually those red and orange colors uh, are the pigments that you're seeing. And they're there all throughout the year. And they do um, kind of pick up other wavelengths of light uh, to be able to contribute to the production of sugars and nutrients. Um, but yeah, so by breaking down those nutrients, they can then use them again in the spring. So actually by growing slowly and storing nutrients and repeating this process throughout their life, it enables the tree to increase growth rates when opportunities arise. So therefore, if there's a large tree in the canopy that's been out shading them and that suddenly comes down in a storm, then they can actually utilize some of those reserves to increase their growth rates uh, and compete with the other trees around them and hopefully make it to the top. So veteran trees. Um, at a certain point, trees will no longer need to grow upwards if they've successfully 
reach the top essentially um and they'll also then start to grow outwards a lot of the time they'll actually stop growing when um their internal structures can no longer support the uh height of the tree and trees will reach a point whereby unique features uh, of veteran and ancient trees begin to develop however this does vary between species and therefore trees such as you may only be considered ancient after a few thousand years um, or something like an oak might actually be considered ancient after a few hundred years so typically bark which once acted as a barrier to insect and fungi similar to how our skin acts to protect us um, and their old age it will become a bit more brittle and it will begin to scar and that means it becomes more susceptible to infection but that also allows for things such as bracket fungi to develop and for insects to actually begin hollowing out sections of the tree and that creates a whole ecosystem within itself now often the older trees will develop lichens and even algae um, and that can develop on the branches uh, and mosses and ferns will also utilize these structures now in some cases these algae will act somewhat like uh, fungi and provide nutrients to the tree that they're deriving and actually if you have uh, frequent rain some of those nutrients might wash off into the soil around it and further supply the roots of the tree so it's a nice cycle of nutrients that's going on there now these veteran trees are often bastions of biodiversity and this is because they support numerous species in and amongst the structure of the tree however with age does come fragility and often these trees will become more susceptible to strong winds and even their own weight in some cases so old oak trees actually uh, i was reading will begin to send down uh, branches as they're getting older uh, towards the ground to act as a sort of walking stick um, but without that support they can often lose limbs and that will make them more susceptible to uh, infections once again if you have a branch torn off um, so yeah management as well typically people will cut down the lower limbs of oaks and that can be somewhat disruptive so then after all those years a tree will eventually die uh, and that's when its structure can no longer support its needs and the wood becomes completely susceptible to all those insects fungi and other organisms However, this tree will actually still go on to support biodiversity. And as the tree actually breaks down, fungi will release those nutrients back into the surrounding soil um, to be used up by other species, other plants, and even uh, other trees. And so it could be the sapling of that tree that begins to use up the nutrients that have been broken down from the parent tree. Now these trees can even provide homes for bats and birds with dead trees often providing fantastic perches for raptors as well in local environments so yeah if you quite often you'll see floodplains with old dead oak trees um, but usually they'll have raptors on there uh, utilizing them as a perch so survival methods so like many species trees exhibit different methods of survival and this includes the things we've discussed like seed distribution methods however they do other things as well such as developing thorns um, and some trees will even produce chemicals to ward off potential predators um, but also they'll actually produce chemicals to attract certain organisms that might fend off potential predators um, so there's multiple different ways in which they can use chemicals now in ecology we like to label things quite a lot and in the case of survival methods uh, one of the basic uh, divisions is between species that adapt and thrive in readily and rapidly changing environments and these are known as r selected species and those which tend to develop slower in more stable environments and these are known as case selected species now a birch tree is a prime example of an r selected species as they essentially produce lots of seeds in the hope that a few of those will colonize new areas and survive and begin to establish new colonies of birch um, but actually the majority of those seeds will fail so it's a really high mortality rate whereas conversely you have something like an oak which will actually invest a lot of its uh, time and energy in developing a single acorn 
Uh, not that there's one acorn on the tree, there will be multiple, but larger acorns um, with more nutrients inside them, which allows them to kind of bide their time more uh, and wait to be in the right climatic conditions and environment. And then it allows them to develop more slowly within those stable environments. And that has the benefits uh, of all the things I mentioned previously with the slow growth, helping with the development of the stem. However, this doesn't necessarily benefit one species or the other as the faster growing colonizing species can often lead the way for others. So with birches, uh, they often establish type of woodland known as secondary woodland. And that's a predecessor to primary woodland uh, often compromised with those longer living species such as oak. And this is because they provide that shelter and support for other uh, plants to come in, which uh, those slower growing species can utilize. So these survival methods therefore allow species to be competitive, but they actually do end up supporting one another in the long run. And it's therefore really important that diverse and wild habitats are maintained throughout an ecosystem to support different species. Now, within the UK, there are at least 50 native uh, tree species, and they make up our most important woodlands. But there are actually many more species which have been introduced over the years, some of which are simply ornamental. Uh, and there are other species which have just become naturalized, uh, like the horse chestnut. So there are some incredibly disruptive species as well, and these are considered invasive. So most conifers, which include pines and firs, are non-native, and you tend to see these uh, around Forestry Commission plantations. So we do have some native um, conifers, such as the Scots pine, the yew and the juniper, and these mostly occur naturally up north in upland environments. However, species such as, such as Scots pine, you might still find everywhere as it was frequently planted as a crop. And also species such as yew are often found in old graveyards and estates. Now, a species that's native to the UK may not necessarily be native to certain areas of the UK. So for example, a uh, beech tree is widespread throughout the UK but it's only naturally found in chalk downland areas. And that's typical of areas in the Southeast of England. But it has really become prevalent uh, due to its use in hedgerows uh, and ornamental planting, as it is incredibly beautiful in the autumn. However, it can be really disruptive in woodlands uh, due to the vast shade it produces in the summer and actually the dense leaf litter that it produces in the autumn. And this leaf litter is incredibly slow to uh, break down and it therefore acts as a sort of suppressant to the ground flora and so it's therefore considered somewhat of a non-native uh, in Devon and other areas which aren't in its natural range and the management of this tree is often required to maintain and enhance those woodlands and allow those native species to that area to thrive. Now there are non-native uh, and invasive species, and these are species which are considered to disrupt and destroy environments. And they typically uh, come from uh, another area, so they're not uh, natural to the UK. So a prevalent uh, woodland invasive is pictured on the screen, and this is rhododendron, which I'm sure you will have seen. Uh, and this produces an Im immense amount of shade on the ground flora. And it produces actually really harsh chemicals, which it then leaches into the soil uh, to suppress growth around it. And the rhododendron can survive in that condition, but other competitors won't be able to. Uh, the other issue with some of these invasive species is that because they're not natural to our environment, they have no natural threats or predators, and that allows them to thrive and spread really rapidly. And therefore, it's only really combated through manual removal methods. So it's a big issue for woodland managers, uh, particularly in conservation areas. So, yeah, it's a, it's a nasty one. So actually, now we'll move on to some identification, uh, because how do we actually know which tree is which? Well, the main things are kind of pictured below. So Typically, specific trees are adapted to specific environments, and therefore geographic location is really important in determining where these trees will thrive. 
Uh, and so location is an important thing. So that's why we say they're native to the UK. So next is the habitat. So geographic location uh, of the UK is quite a broad area. And within the UK, there's lots of environmental variation. So soil types will vary, altitude will vary, uh, water supply will vary, and that all contributes to determining the type of habitat. And this will further narrow down the species that you expect to find within those habitats. So then we can look at uh, the actual physical features of the tree. So things such as leaves, uh, the buds in the winter are really useful when there's no leaves, uh, bark to a certain extent, seeds, the flowers and the fruit. All of these are unique characteristics to different trees and that can help to actually define the tree that you're looking at. And actually, if all else fails, well, DNA sampling and genetic identification is now becoming really widespread um, within ecology. I don't really use it, it's a bit fancy, um, but scientists actually now are able to just go take soil samples in an area and derive what species are there uh, within the environment. So on some common broadleaf species, so in the UK, we have quite a few oak species and two of our natives are sessile and English oak. So sessile oak, uh, the leaves are pictured on the left and the sessile oak has uh, stalkless acorns and longer stems. As you can see, they're really quite nice long stems compared to that of the English oak on the right. Um, so English oak will have actually stalk stems, so they're nice and long and shorter leaves, uh, sorry, shorter stems on the leaves. But I'm not sure if you can see, but um, yeah, you can't tell too much on this photo, sadly. But um, uh, at the base of English oak, they actually have something called an oracle, which attaches at the base of the leaf. Um, and that's not really featured on the sessile oak. So oak can actually be a primary tree in habitat called North Atlantic oak woodlands, which are incredibly important as they're one of our most unique habitats um, throughout the UK. And they're actually not necessarily common, but uh, they are present throughout Devon. And it's one of the main areas where you can actually find them. However, oaks can also be found in hedgerows and as standalone trees in fields and other woodlands. Uh, but often these trees that are in hedgerows or in fields, particularly ancient uh, or veteran trees, would have been remnants of old woods, uh, which were cleared to actually make the field or the hedgerow. So annoyingly with sessile and English oak, they do hybridize, meaning they interbreed, and therefore the features of the leaves actually become a bit uh, meshed together. So that can make it even more difficult to distinguish. And also just to complicate things even further, there are quite a few non-native oaks actually naturalized within the UK. So there's a species called turkey oak, and that has similar shaped leaves, um, but they're a lot thinner, they're quite long, and their acorns aren't hairy, but they almost have thick hairs coming off of the top of them, which make them really easy to ID. Um, and then we also have a species of oak called holm oak. And this is typically found in coastal areas, so you might find it in and around Plymouth. Um, and these leaves are a little bit more shiny and uh, the young leaves are actually spiny like holly. So next is hazel um, and they are the tree that produces hazelnuts. So if you see hazelnuts around the base of something, chances are it's a hazel. Um, but if there's no nuts around it, uh, then the actual leaves are quite easy to ID. So they're nice and broad uh, and they have this kind of longer tip at the end. Now, hazel trees were traditionally coppiced to produce wood and that leads to the growth pattern that you can see on the left where there's lots of shoots of stems. Um, and this is a, kind of a reaction to the cutting of those stems. It sends up more to uh, compensate for that. And this characteristic is actually thought to have developed as a reaction to large herbivores that we used to have in our environment. Uh, but that resulted in an you know, ideal trait for humans to utilize throughout the year to produce more wood. Um, but now actually we are seeing some of those herbivores return, not necessarily large ones, although beavers are quite large, 
Uh, but beavers will actually utilize a lot of these species, such as hazel and willow, which produce more growth as a, as a result of pressure, and that results in a continual food supply for them. So the other thing with hazel is it actually produces quite long yellow male flowers, which you might have seen in the autumn and winter, and they usually open as early as January. However, lesser known is the small pink female flower, which you can spot close up. And if you've got something like hand lens, it's quite useful for spotting them. Now, ash was once a prevalent tree within our landscape, and it still is, but it is now declining throughout the UK and Devon as a result of ash dieback. So its leaves are an easy way to identify them, and this is due to the alternating pattern of the leaves at the stem and they always have one terminal leaf at the end. Now the leaves are oval shaped and slightly serrated, which hopefully you can see from the photo. So you can also identify ash in the winter um, through their small black buds. Um, and actually a way that I've been using more recently is actually a fungi that grows on them. And um, so because so much ash is afflicted by ash dieback, there's a lot of dying ash in our landscape. And that means uh, fungi can take hold. And there's a fungi known as King Alfred's cake, which just looks like a little black lump, really. Um, and that grows almost exclusively on ash trees. Um, and so that's actually quite a nice way to identify them now. Now, the other thing with ash is they have really rough bark. And that is a really vital habitat for lichens, as it allows them to easily become established. And actually, ash are just incredibly important trees in the lamps in the landscape um, as they're often quite large and prominent and that can be a really important habitat uh, for butterflies to congregate around. So rowan is another tree that you might come across uh, and you might be thinking it looks quite similar to ash with the leaves and it is actually also known as mountain ash and that is due to the similar structure. However if you look at the leaves you can see that they are more deeply serrated and they don't actually end uh, completely cleanly in that terminal spike. Now, these trees are often a lot smaller than ash and less robust looking. And they will produce these unique red berries, which make them really easy to ID uh, when they're out, of course. Um, and it is an incredibly hardy tree, and it can often be found growing in rocky environments, on thinner, more acidic soils. And it's typically found at higher altitudes. Now we're kind of moving on now into some more hedgerow species that you might come across. And hawthorn is one of those that is most abundant in our hedgerows. And it produces, produces these really distinctive red berries, which are vital for birds uh, and other species to stock up on uh, for the winter. Now the blossom on hawthorn are often some of the first to appear in the spring. And they vary from quite a pale white to a slightly pinkish hue. And the leaves themselves are often quite a pale green. And as you can see from the photo, they're really deeply lobed. And we don't really have many other um, leaves on trees that look similar to this. Um, there is another species of hawthorn called Midland hawthorn, um, which as you can guess is predominantly found in the Midlands. Um, so you're unlikely to find it in and around Devon. So with the name hawthorn, uh, they do have spines and these spines emerge at the same point as the bud on the stem. And that helps you to distinguish it from other species such as blackthorn, which can look quite similar. Um, and blackthorn actually has buds growing on the spines as opposed to next to them. So that's a good one to remember. And actually, just on a side note, there's quite an interesting thing with hawthorn. And there's a certain fungi which targets the leaves. And you'll be able to identify these leaves in the summer as they'll be different in colour to that pale green, usually a kind of reddish brown. Um, and when broken down, these leaves have an almost perfume incense type smell uh, because of this fungi. And that's quite an easy way to identify whether it's been um, infected. So another hedgerow favorite is the blackthorn, uh, which unlike hawthorn has more oval leaves, if you can see, and these are serrated too. Now they also produce uh, early spring blossoms, uh, but once the slows develop, which is the fruit you can see, um, it's really easy to identify them and also useful for making things such as slow gin. So 
As mentioned previously, buds themselves do develop on the spine, um, which you can't really see too well from this photo, sadly. Um, and that is an easy way to distinguish it from other species. Now, similar to hawthorn, it's a really important species for providing food to small mammals and birds. Uh, but it also supports one of our rarer butterflies, which is the brown hair streak, which almost exclusively lays its eggs on uh, blackthorn. And that's the species which will also utilize ash as well. Now, elder can often be found independently in fields or in and amongst hedgerows, um, but typically it looks a little bit out of place um, as it doesn't produce as bushy growth and it doesn't really work when laying hedgerows. Um, so it's also a good way to see if a woodland's being enriched as typically um, elder will grow on those kind of boundaries where there might be agricultural enrichment. Um, it has really distinctive corky bark, which sadly there wasn't a photo I could use. Um, however, the elderberries and elderflowers are a really easy way to identify this species in the spring and summer. Its leaflets as well are often in sets of five to seven. Um, and they also have sparsely uh, sort of serrated edges. And another thing with them is they'll bruise really easily if you kind of crush them and they produce quite an unpleasant smell. Uh, and it's also said that they help to ward off the devil in case that is something you're interested in. So field maple is another one you might see out and about, and it has these small deep green leaves which are divided into five lobes and they display really beautiful golden yellow colours in the autumn. And that can make them stand out really nicely in and amongst hedgerows. Now they also produce uh, pink tinged wing seeds, which you can see just above the leaf. Um, and this allows them to be distributed by the wind, similar to other species such as sycamore. Um, now I used to refer to these as helicopters as, as a kid, but I'm sure they'll have different names elsewhere. So you might call them something else. Now there are some similar lookalikes such as Norway maple and sycamore, but typically field maple leaves are somewhat smaller and more rounded. Um, and you'll typically find field maples in hedgerows, woodlands and fields. Oops. So next up is the silver birch and as an ecologist and conservationist it's somewhat controversial that silver birch is one of my favourite trees and this is because it tends to really quickly invade and develop in sensitive woodland, uh, wetlands and heathlands and can be quite damaging as it tends to dry out those areas. Um, as it sort of transpires and the water's evaporated. However, it is also a pioneer species and that does lead the way for other woodlands to develop. And I grew up in the Midlands and uh, the area of Canic Chase by me has lots of silver birch. Um, so I have lots of fond memories kind of being in and amongst it. So it's a really hardy tree and it can be found in many woodlands, moorlands, wetlands, and even in gardens, it's actually planted as an ornamental because it's quite a pretty tree. Um, so it has this really distinct, uh, distinctive silvery white bark and it also sheds this bark. Um, and it looks a little bit like tissue paper as it's coming off of the, uh, the stem. So the leaves themselves are somewhat triangular shaped, as you can see on the left. Uh, and they also are quite deeply serrated. And these are often found on drooping branches. And there is another birch called downy birch in the UK, which does look similar in terms of shape. But actually, if you look closely at the branches, um, it has small hairs running all the way up it. And they kind of look a bit more dishevelled, if that means anything. Um, but I wouldn't worry about it too much. And then finally, the last uh, broadleaf that I'll go through is the older. And it's typically found in damp waterlogged habitats um, as it can survive in waterlogged conditions. So you might find it in wetlands or riversides. So it has these broad, uh, almost ridge serrated leaves, uh, which form a slight indent at the end, uh, which is quite a nice way to distinguish it as quite a lot of the other species have that terminal spike at the end. Um, however, it also produces these flowers and cones, which can be a really easy way to identify it as the cones actually remain on the tree throughout most of the year. Now, from a distance, I often think of older as having slightly reddish purplish hue, which can make it quite easy to identify it from a distance. However, you are best to get up close to it. 
Now, a cool thing with alder is that uh, it will readily drop its leaves in the autumn uh, when they're green. It won't bother to actually break down those nutrients and store them. And that's because of the environments that it thrives in. Uh, and actually the kind of damp environments allows those nutrients to be broken down and the bacteria that's present in their roots allows them to uptake that nitrogen really easily. Um, so that kind of concludes my bit on IDing trees. Um, now, if you are interested in going out and IDing trees, there are a load of really useful online resources. So most websites such as the Wildlife Trust or Woodland Trust will have little pages on each tree and how to identify them. Uh, but one of the best ways actually is to pick up an ID book and you can find them in most bookshops online or I pick up most of mine from charity shops such as Oxfam Books. Um, and now Helen will send through an email tomorrow and that will most likely have some links to some of those resources. So observing individual trees is fascinating in itself, but the habitats and ecosystems they support um, are equally and if not more fascinating. So the structure of trees is actually vital in establishing woodland ecosystems with the roots stabilizing soils uh, and providing structure, the fruits and seeds providing food for other organisms and the branches providing uh, refuge for numerous species. Um, and actually uh, the nutrients that they produce in the leaves when they fall down contribute to maintaining, uh, maintaining nutrient balance within those soils. Um, now, they are by no means doing this independently, as things such as fungi, bacteria, invertebrates, and lots of other species have a really major role in maintaining and supporting ecosystems. But you can almost think of trees as providing some of the architecture to a woodland. So even trees in themselves can host a wide array of organisms, uh, with lichens, mosses, and ferns utilizing branches and creating a whole other world above the ground. And you can kind of see that on the small photo to the right. Now, some of the most diverse habitats on Earth are rainforests. And typically we think of jungles close to the equator in places like uh, South America, Southeast Asia, and central parts of Africa. However, believe it or not, uh, the UK once had large swathes of rainforest, a uh, type of rainforest called temperate rainforest. And a few small areas still uh, remain uh, predominantly along the west coast of the UK and in parts of Northern Ireland. Now Devon is really important and supports some of these areas. And there's some of the most fantastic forests you will ever visit with really diverse mosses, plants and ferns, and if you've ever come across air plants in a plant shop um, or from Attenborough documentaries, uh, these forests do actually support our own air plants. So there's a fern called Polypody, which you can actually see on that photo. And that's an epiphytic fern, which is another name for an air plant, really, um, which can survive on the branches of trees such as oaks and ash. Now, it's estimated that these uh, temperate rainforests can support over 200 species of bryophytes and mosses and hundreds of species of lichen alone, and that's not including any other um, plants or mammals or insects. So it's just an incredible amount of biodiversity. Now, these rainforests are supported by those ancient oaks, birch, ash and hazel, and they're often found within crags and ravines and river gorges and areas that were kind of protected from intensive agriculture and woodland clearances. And these train uh, trains, <laughs> these trees actually go so far as to help uh, maintain the moisture within these environments uh, by sort of trapping some of the moisture and extracting it from the ground. And on a warm day, if you're actually walking through them, the humidity really is noticeable. Now, the Wildlife Trust actually has gained some funding recently to work to reestablish and restore these rainforests. So it's worth keeping an eye out on these and hopefully within well, quite a few years time, we'll start to see these developing more across Devon. So trees themselves also have to find and utilise suitable climates and conditions. However, as a tree, it's not exactly easy or possible uh, to get up and move elsewhere. Um, despite Lord of the Rings with Ents uh, moving quite freely. Uh, but instead, they move over successive generations with trees slowly moving across a landscape through that 
seed dispersion and then thriving in the suitable areas that they come across. However, climate change is actually placing more pressure upon species and these warming climates typically encourage a northward shift in species um, as those typically cooler climates warm up. It means the climates further north, which cooler will then warm and create the conditions that were once uh, suitable further south. Um, now, this also places pressure upon upland species as, um, as well as species uh, temperatures increasing northwards. Uh, they increase vertically as well. So that pushes the temperature of um, higher altitudes uh, up and that can reduce the amount of upland habitat available to species. Now, some species such as birch, as I mentioned uh, previously, can easily spread and establish elsewhere. So they're quite adaptable and things such as uh, willows and alder can survive flooding, um, which is quite useful. Um, but species such as oak, which are slower, uh, slower growing and reliant on those stable environments can really suffer. Now, the movement of species, not just uh, sort of trees and plants, um, can also further spread disease, and that can be highly problematic for trees. So Dutch elm disease has decimated elm throughout the UK. You'll hardly ever see mature elm. Uh, but more recently, ash dieback is incredibly prevalent and has spread like wildfire throughout the UK. And as such, we could face loss of up to 90% of our ash trees. So diversity in an ecosystem is therefore really important and healthy forests uh, with differing broadleaf species can actually help to withstand change. And that's by providing different niches for other species to utilize uh, if one species massively declines. But actually it also provides a bit of a buffer uh, for other species as well. Now this is where a nice little project that uh, wildlife trust is running comes in but um as the uk landscape is incredibly fragmented and manicured uh, already with farmland sort of dividing up uh, those remaining areas of woodland uh, it means that those fragments of broadleaf woodland and hedgerows are actually really vital for supporting biodiversity throughout the uk uh, and devon and all the other counties so the lack of wild spaces makes it even harder for species to adapt to climate change because there's essentially nowhere safe for them to go. Um, and with trees, that is all the more exaggerated, and that's due to that slow successive movement over generations. And therefore, it's really important that us humans and our organisations support our treescapes. Uh, and as part of that, Devon Wildlife Trust set up Saving Devon Treescapes project. So the prominence of ash dieback uh, in the Devon landscape um, has meant that we've seen massive losses of the tree from our landscape, and it really is particularly devastating. However, um, by supporting the planting of uh, different species of native broadleaves, the project actually aims to further develop diverse hedgerows. Um, and it aims to plant 250,000 trees uh, and actually to support and engage with communities through things such as tree nurseries, uh, species monitoring and tree planting to kind of ensure future conservation. Now, as the world combats climate change and its consequences, trees offer a really vital way of combating those effects. So all the woodland in the UK is thought to store around 230 million tonnes of carbon and actually our most diverse ancient woodlands are thought to store uh, 77 million tonnes of that carbon alone, which is really quite astounding when you consider that our ancient woodland covers less than 2% of the UK. So the amount of carbon stored will actually only ever increase as the cover of woodland increases and actually diverse and wild broadleaf woodlands offer the best opportunities for this. So woodland also plays a vital role in slowing down the flow of water with hedgerows and woods uh, helping to mitigate the effect of flash flooding, which has become all the more common with climate change. So actually the manicured nature of our landscape has often led to more compacted and exposed soils, which do little to impede or absorb the flow of water. However, diverse woodlands actually play a really important role in providing both the physical uh, barrier to the environment 
but also by supporting healthy ecosystems and soils, they can actually absorb and hold more water. And in return, that supports more species. Now, the return of beavers uh, within Devon and throughout the UK further complements this through their natural ability to engineer wetland ecosystems. However, they are also reliant on trees and the availability of species such as willow and hazel and other broadleaf species. And they work in conjunction really uh, to support the beavers, but also to encourage the growth of those trees. Now, I've mostly focused on the natural environment throughout this talk. However, trees are a really fundamental part of our urban landscapes. So individual trees and woodlands within cities and towns provide vital stepping stones for wildlife, allowing them to move throughout what would otherwise be quite inhospitable environments, but are a few kind of urban specialists. However, the presence of trees also contributes to the production of oxygen and the cleaning of air within our cities, which is really important with the amount of pollution from cars. Um, they also help to improve conditions for humans um, in what can be often polluted environments. So the structure of trees as well will help to muffle uh, pollution such as noise, which is often overlooked. So um, the structure of trees and leaves can often dampen the sound and that's beneficial for both humans and wildlife. And the other addition of that structure is the shade that trees provide can also maintain cooler environments in cities. And one of the most important features of trees within a landscape is actually the benefits they have for mental well-being. So humans have always been a part of the natural world and green space is intrinsic to our nature. And actually the presence of trees in an urban landscape provides both beautiful areas, um, areas to meet, areas to shelter, but actually places to relax and support our, our mental health and well-being. So Ultimately, trees play a really essential role in supporting diverse ecosystems and humans. Um, however, it goes two ways, as our communities can also work to support trees. And Plymouth is actually right at the forefront of this in the UK. So the Plymouth and South Devon Community Forest is a fantastic project which aims to plant hundreds of trees to connect the heart of the city to the surrounding moorland. And as a community forest, what it looks to do is encompass all sorts of land from community woodland to hedgerows uh, to private woodland. And the idea is to create a rich ecosystem which can be used by wildlife and people. Now, by supporting woodlands uh, in cities, it ensures their presence for future generations, and that will allow people to stay connected with the environment and learn to conserve it. Now, additionally, uh, you may be aware of the Derriford Community Park project, uh, which also aims to provide communities within Plymouth with more wild spaces for both recreation, mental well-being and areas to socialise. But actually, it's also planning to um, produce areas to grow food. Now, I've not really touched too much upon the role trees play in providing food, but actually is another really interesting topic. Um, and there's something called food forests, which offer really interesting alternative means of producing food. Um, but I won't really go on too much about that. I recommend looking it up though. Um, but within Derriford Community Park, they are looking to establish a community orchard, uh, which has the benefit of growing food, making juice, but also providing an area for people to be able to socialize, which combines multiple benefits for trees and communities. And then finally, there's some of the work which the Green Minds Project has actually been doing in and around Kiam, whereby loads of community effort has been put into improving areas, uh, particularly in wildlife meadows by um, planting and uh, sort of native wildflowers and collecting the seeds. Um, but also now they're looking to plant more native species, uh, tree species, and a few ornamental species as well to both support nature, communities, and the environment. So Plymouth, is a really exciting place to be right now for nature and there's lots of opportunities to get involved. But anyway, thank you very much for listening and I hope that you learned a thing or two about trees. Um, now, if you've been thinking of a few questions, now will be the time to ask them. Yeah, thanks, Jack. That's um, fantastic. It was so, such a fascinating talk. And if do you want to stop sharing your... Uh, presentation yep. and then I have got a few questions here I mean I've noticed that we have run slightly over time so apologies for that but we'll try and just 
spend a couple of minutes just go running through a few of the questions. Um, I think I can, between us, we can hopefully give you some pointers. Somebody asked early on, um, oh, and also if you've got feedback about the talk tonight, it's really useful for us to have to see if you enjoyed it. If you've got suggestions for improving it, please pop it in the chat. That'd be really useful to us uh, if you direct it to me. Thanks. Um, if young trees develop strength from being buffeted by the wind, does this mean that saplings with covers, i.e. the tree guards, to protect them from deer are overall weaker? Um, does this shorten their life or make them susceptible to infection? Potentially. Um, so it's one of those where it does actually protect them from grazing. Um, so it will allow them to, to develop and they will still flex um, within the, the guards. Um, so it's been done for years, so they still do become established, um, but it is potentially something that might inhibit that, um, but I'm not entirely sure. That's a really good question. Though. I guess it's a balance between them being sort of completely eaten by deer <laughs> as to and the strength that this uh, the strength they develop. But I think it's important that the guards are taken off at the right time when the tree has actually sort of got to a decent size. Um, yeah, definitely. Also, I'm not. This is a tricky one. Um, you know, you mentioned about how the, the chemicals that are coming out of the rhododendron. Um, yeah. This person was wondering, could, are there trees that you can plant which promote the growth of any of our native trees in particular? I'm thinking that would be any other native trees. But are, are there any in particular that would be good for that? Not that I can think of um really sorry <laughs> yeah sure no I think I think just generally the planting native as opposed to non-native will be the best thing that you can do because they're, they're used to the ground conditions they've grown like that for such a long time whereas the non-natives are much more recent addition aren't they yeah um, also just sort of simply by planting more species you're providing more niches for other organisms and yeah the more complex an environment is uh, the more likely it will be to be able to support numerous species and kind of um, occupy space and buffer it from those invasives. Yeah, and this links in with the next question, which is uh, and a couple of questions, actually. One is, what are the best trees to be planting now for the UK's ecology and our planet? Um, another is any advice on establishing a small wooded area of native trees and former farmland? Um, and, the, and would it be better to plant the same types of trees together or plant them randomly? Um, have you got any thoughts on that? So certain tree species will do better in different environments. Um, so typically in wet areas, you're looking at things like alders and willows. Um, other trees won't do as well in those environments. Um, but there are some really good online resources. It's quite a big topic, actually, to go into what species to plant. Um, mm. So... I would recommend looking that up. I'm sure we can provide some links. Uh, on yeah, that. I think the Woodland Trust website's really good for that. Uh, there's even for things like farm planting on former farmland, there may even be some funding that you can access yeah. to help you do that. There's a lot of grants around. Um, and yeah, with planting, when I've worked in Woodland Creation planting new woods, you tend to plant in small groups of each species you probably wouldn't just throw them all in randomly but I mean in naturally when woods regenerate they are fairly random <laughs> yeah. so I think it, it, the main thing is get out there planting and just plant native don't plant ash trees at the moment because there needs to be some work done around the, the ones that are genetically going to be resistant to the dieback um, uh, um I think just... we've covered Go on. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to say, just to add to that, with kind of enough time as well, you can take a bit more of a relaxed approach to it. So mm. the land itself will almost tell you what will grow there. If you're planting a variety of species and one is consistently failing, um, possibly the conditions aren't right for it there. So mm. given mm. enough time, you can actually just um, observe and learn from the landscape yourself yeah. really but yeah, yeah good resources and yeah <laughs> and uh planting if i was wanting to plant someone says one or two trees in my urban garden what would be best to plant um i mean i've got some odd thoughts i think uh like something that isn't going to get too enormous like a yeah. crab apple tree something yeah. like that would be lovely we've got a couple in our garden uh, and they the blossom on them is lovely in the spring and we have managed to make some little jars of crab apple jelly as well uh, have you got any other thoughts yeah I, I was going to say something similar just kind of 
flowering fruiting trees are really nice because you get the benefit of blossom so cherries are really nice um, yeah and that supports a lot of uh, birds as well and that's actually really important in urban landscapes is having that food source yeah and if you have space uh, to put in a hedge hedgerows are great because you can pack in loads of species they can be really good for wild food for wildlife perhaps for yourself collecting things like slows that jack mentioned um, and you can let the occasional tree within there grow up like a field maple into a, a, a quite a larger tree but not as enormous as an oak tree you don't want to annoy your neighbors too much or uh, and the roots that yeah. they do get really big <laughs> um and then someone's asking about record the, accessing the recording yes i'll be putting out an email probably tomorrow with any follow-up links uh, and it, you'll be able to look at the recording it'll be on the green minds uh, youtube channel um and then finally oh some some nice comments thank you um i think we would have to leave it there someone has mentioned um just uh, da, 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 da. oh should what do people what do you think about ivy that's climbing up trees should people cut it back it's quite a contentious issue isn't yeah, it yeah it is a contentious one i mean it it has its uses within an environment um as well um it, it depends how you're managing woodland really um i think yeah. in some cases where it is strangling kind of the regrowth of saplings if you're wanting natural regeneration yeah. um then actually removing it is good but you don't want to completely remove it um because it will also support other aspects of uh, yeah. the ecosystem yeah yeah you've got to just judge it it is quite contentious you can probably look up more on that as well yeah yeah Okay, so I think I'm sorry that we've run over, but I, I'm sure you'll agree it was a really interesting talk. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, and yeah, we'll put out some follow up information. Uh, and thanks for the feedback. And thank you very much, Jack, for the last in our sort of winter series of Green Minds talks. That's been really great. And actually, you'll be able to view all the talks uh, also on the link that I'll send through tomorrow <laughs> if you would like to see more. So thank you everyone.